A very good morning, everybody, and welcome to yet another webinar brought to you by SIOS, the South African Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. My name is Neil Snorkia. I am the CEO of SIOS, and it's an absolute pleasure for us to host this webinar that will be presented this morning by the Department of Employment and Labor on the draft noise-induced hearing loss regulations, which I'm sure as safety and health practitioners, you would have noticed that it was recently published uh, for public comment. And I'm sure all of you are keen this morning to hear from the Department of Employment and Labor what these draft regulations are bringing for us and what we should take note of, of changes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as per usual, uh, these SIOSH uh, webinars are CPD verified by SIOSH. Uh, we have not received requests from any other professional bodies or organizations for CPD verification. So if you are not a SIOSH member, you will have to approach your particular professional body or the association that you belong to and ask if they will, will verify this for CPD points. So from a SIOSH point of view, it is CPD verified with two CPD points. Please note that we do not issue certificates. Your email of attendance confirmation email that you will receive uh, will, will suffice for you to claim your two CPD points on the SIOSH profile. Also, a very warm welcome to uh, guests. Uh, I know this uh, invitation was sent out further to members. Um, so to all our guests, non SIOSH members, welcome to you as well. Um, we are always uh, pleased to bring you um, uh, presentations, not just to our members on, on these webinars, but to the public at large as well. Um, just a quick note with regards to the chat in the Q&A. Um, please post your questions, which it's relative to the topic this morning and to the presenters uh, uh, part of the presentation in the Q&A. Please note that we will not field questions in the Q&A or answer them or direct them to the presenters if it's not related to the draft noise-induced hearing loss regulations or the code of practice that will be discussed. Um, and it also has to be related to that particular part of the presentation. Use the chat for what it is, uh, chat, uh, compliments, um, greet, meet, et cetera, et cetera. So just as a matter of interest, um, SIOS has also formed what we call a technical committee. As soon as this draft set of regulations is published for comment, we form a technical committee with experts in the in the particular field, in this case, occupational hygiene and health, uh, as well as legal, OHS legal advisors. And we submit our uh, comments on behalf of SIOS as well, and we're busy with that technical committee. So for SIOS, it's also great to be here this morning uh, to listen to see uh, what the Department of Labor has to say about these regulations. Um, another note just to take note of, uh, so you don't have to post it in the, in the chat, is yes, this uh, webinar will be recorded, uh, and yes, the recording and the presentations will be made available to all SIOSH members on our website and our Facebook page, and the webinar is also currently live streamed on YouTube, so it will also live on our YouTube if you want to revisit again, uh, or if you missed something and want to go back to it. I think that covers everything from... Uh, the introduction with regards to what webinar you are in and what we can expect. It gives me great pleasure now to, to uh, hand over to you, uh, Senior Specialist Bulewa Huna, uh, to do the official welcoming address. Bulewa, if I could, yes, I see your, your camera is on and your um, mic has been muted. So uh, thank you once again on behalf of SIOS for, for doing this and, uh, and having your whole team here this morning uh, to field the questions and to do the presentations. We really appreciate it. Over to you for the welcoming address. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nils. Uh, we are really grateful as the department for this opportunity that you once again partnered with us in order to bring the message uh, to our stakeholders as we will be unpacking the draft induced hearing, noise induced hearing loss regulations, which are a product of consultation through the technical committee consisting of organized business, organized labor, government, and the specialists from the different fields. 
So as the way of opening remarks, uh, we just want to remind you that as South Africa is part of the global uh, community, the statistics in terms of the ILO indicates that about 4% of the world's gross domestic product is lost due to accidents and work-related diseases. And we know very well that noise-induced hearing loss is a work-related uh, disease. So the economic costs of these poor occupational health and safety practices, they negatively affect the employee because there may be loss of income and they may negatively affect the quality of life. Imagine if you are deaf now and you can no longer be uh, re-deployed uh, uh, to another workstation to do another job and you end up getting uh, boarded off at work and you stay at home, then there's gonna affect other family uh, members. And then with respect to the employer, there's always the issue of the medical and rehabilitation costs if that person may be rehabilitated and also the insurance that may increase. So as the department, we do not accept and we never accept the proposition that injury and disease go with the job. In June 2019, just to take you back a bit, during the ILO centenary uh, celebrations, there was a declaration that was adopted by all ILO constituencies that safety and health at work are fundamental to decent work. And this final decision was taken on 10 June 2022, and it was mutually agreed by all constituencies now that safety and health at work is a fundamental right. So the approach we have taken to these regulations is honoring that decision. Because with respect to Convention 155 and Convention 187, which were technical conventions, they are now a fundamental conventions, meaning that everything that is in terms of these regulations is observing that fundamental right when it comes to issues of noise management in the workplace. With respect to dissent work, if we take a focus on these regulations, safety and health at work is indispensable as a hearing ability is part of our daily lives and the ability to resume work safely. Because if you have a hearing disability due to noise exposures at work, it becomes a problem because it's gonna affect your interaction with your work at work and also your interaction with other colleagues at work. And you may not be able to hear any uh, emergency signals and so forth and any instructions that you are supposed to be verbally listening to. And also, it is important now that with the approach of these regulations that these fundamental principles and rights at work are observed and employers and employees make sure that there is commitment to significant health and safety improvements beyond meeting, meeting legal requirements. Hence, we are taking the different approach with these regulations. So with the proactive and preventive approach that we have taken, we aimed at improving on the 2003 regulations because the current noise use hearing loss regulations were promulgated in March 2003. They are almost 20 years old. So we have extended the scope not only to look at the noise rating limit of 85 dBA, we have included action levels, issue of addressing autotoxic chemicals because there may be uh, workplaces where noise is below 85 dBA, but there are autox autotoxic chemicals in that work environment. And also we have looked at also at a, a combination of exposure with noise and vibration, as well as earlier reporting of issues to the chief inspector in terms of section 25. We have also now because we have to be inclusive when we're talking about a fundamental right with respect to safety and health at work. Now we have looked at vulnerable employees and also addressed gender specific aspects on these regulations. And these are included in information, instruction and training as well as on risk assessment so that vulnerable employees as well as gender aspects are addressed when the risk assessment is conducted and when training material is developed so that it becomes inclusive and, uh, and covers all parties at work. Also, I'm sure you have read the regulations. They have noted the differences between the code of practice and SANS 10083. Please rest assured, 
We, as the department, we sit on the SANS committee for 10083, and these uh, differences will be aligned as SANS 10083 is incorporated in the noise induced hearing loss regulations. As the regulator, we will address it with, a, a SAPC, with the SAPC committee. So, with this proactive and preventive approach, it is also meant to support the sustainable development goals. As South Africa, are part of the global community. So when you look at the sustainable development goals, SDG3 and SDG8, they are linked to our NDP outcomes because SDG3 is linked to NDP outcome two. We want a long and healthy life for all South Africans. We don't want South Africans that are deaf. We want South Africans that are still able to play with their grandkids when they retire. Also, it is linked to SDG 8, which is linked to NDB outcome 4, looking at decent employment through inclusive economic growth. So the quality of life of all workers through these regulations is ensured. And also, if you look at the agenda 2063, we also link to that because we are looking at the prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Though these regulations through your support We'll make sure that as the department, we contribute to the NDP outcomes, we contribute to the African Agenda 2063, we contribute also to the SDGs. So with this preventive component through the regulations, we want to make sure that there will be reduced accidents, reduced injuries, reduced occupational diseases, and improved quality of life and improved products and services. Because when all parties work together, then we all benefit. So the last message I want to give you, as we have uh, published these regulations for public comments, let us all bring our ideas on the table. We have brought our apple. We want you to bring your apple so that we do not keep our ideas to ourselves and to keep yours to yourselves, but let us bring the ideas together and then we all have two ideas that we'll be working with. So we will appreciate your inputs and comments on the regulations so that after the public comment phase is closed, the technical committee can move forward and make sure that the product is one that will help all South Africans and beyond South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bulewa, for that uh, welcoming address. And um, rest assured, from a SIOSH point of view, we will definitely be bringing our uh, Apple along. As indicated in, uh, in, the, in my opening part, uh, we have also formed a technical committee with uh, ex expert, experts that will, on behalf of SIOSH, submit uh, co uh, comments. And just as a matter of interest to our SIOSH members, those comments that SIOS compile and submit as per usual will be sent to you as well uh, for your perusal. Um, also just uh, note uh, with regards to the interest in these draft regulations and the support, uh, I remember many years ago when I started in occupational health and safety as a, as a, as a junior safety officer, when new legislation came out, uh, it was still the MOS Act then and regulations came out, there wasn't these platforms where one could deliberate and, and collectively submit comments. And very few comments were submitted on draft regulations. Whereas now, uh, and with the like of, of SIOS in the midst as well, uh, we can really support the Department of Employment and Labor by submitting comprehensive um, comments on these regulations. And just as a matter of interest, we are sitting at 637 attendees in this webinar at the moment. So. Warren, no, no pressure on you, which I'm going to call on next, which is specialist from the Department of Employment uh, and Labor, Warren Mallon, who's going to do the actual presentation on the draft noise induced hearing loss risk regulations. Warren, if I can please ask you to now put your camera on, uh, unmute yourself, and share your screen, and please enjoy and have a great presentation. Thank you. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Niels. As uh, everyone can see, the presentation on yes, the screen. We can, we can see Warren. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and everyone can hear me clearly, huh? Yes. Hundred percent. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy. Great. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So again, thank you to Sayosh for hosting us. So I'm going to be going through the actual draft regulation, 
Um, so yeah, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the parts of the regulation that changed from the current one to the draft one. So if there isn't something that's covered, that means that it hasn't changed in the regulation. Okay, so yeah, so that's just what I'm going to cover, the regulation, and then a one slide about the comments that need to be submitted. Okay, so on the definitions, um, I haven't put all of them in because um, there are quite a few, um, but I've just focused on some new ones. So we're gonna start off with the competent person definition. Um, so what we did as a TC, we decided to split the competent person definition. So one will be for audiometric testing and the other one for, would be your normal competent person definition, which we have in our other regulations, which talks to the risk assessment. But then for the competent person for audiometric testing, we also split that into two, into one for screening audiometry and the other one for diagnostic audiology. So the definition that we are proposing for the screening audiometry, that is exactly the same as what is currently legislated as the competent person. So it mentions um, those four uh, professionals. So it's the ENT, um, the speech therapist, the audiologist or the occupational medicine practitioner, as well as a, someone with audiometric test techniques which is registered with the South African um, Society for Occupational Health Nursing. Okay, so that didn't change much. Um, so then the second part of the definition is for B for audiognostic audiology. And so this is a new uh, edition. So this is where it's be only referring to an ENT or an audiologist. So there are differences between the two. So that's why we need certain people to do the one, the audiometric testing, and then other professionals to do the diagnostic audiology. Um, then just quickly onto the definition, the other one for competent person. So we put this for risk assessment because that's where it is referred to in the legislation. And this is the um, one that we are using in our other regulations, as I mentioned previously. So it is a person who has in respect to the work or task to be performed, the required knowledge, training, and experience in noise, and where applicable qualifications that includes noise. And then, yeah, provided that the appropriate qualification and training are registered in terms of the provision of the NQF Act. And then the Part B is similar with the Act and the regulations made under the Act. Okay, then we also added a definition of exposure. And this means the extent to which a person is exposed to noise at the workplace as determined by the noise risk assessment and includes potential or accidental exposure. And the word exposed has the same meaning as exposure. Okay, then we also included a definition of what a noise is because um, it currently isn't one. So noise means any unwanted sound that may cause a noise or interference with speech or communication and or hearing impairment. Uh, then, as mentioned earlier by Ms. Puna, we are we have this we are wanting to broaden the scope of the regulation. So, by that, we have introduced the definition of a noise action level. So, it's got two parts. So, the one part is for the normal eight-hour exposure, and that is at eighty-two decibels. And then we also introduced the one for um, peak exposure, and that is above one hundred and thirty-five. DBC. Okay, then we also induce the uh, same for the noise rating limit. Um, the first part of the definition is pretty much the same. It refers to the 85 or above for continuous noise. And then for peak noise, um, we've introduced a limit of 137 decibels for impulse noise. Okay, and this states when certain actions or countermeasures need to be taken. Um, then also, as mentioned earlier, we are introducing uh, autotoxic chemicals and the concomitant exposure with noise in the workplace. So um, this definition, you will see it refers to chemical agents that damage the ear and cause hearing loss. So that definition of chemical agents, you can also find in the regulations for hazardous chemical agents, which was also promulgated last year. 
And then we've added the definition of what a vulnerable employee is. Um, so this means an employee who is at higher risk of injury, disease, or complications. Okay, then moving on to the scope of the actual regulation. Um, so yeah, these regulations will apply to any employer or self-employed person at the workplace under their control, where a person is exposed to continuous or impulse noise at or above the, act, the applicable noise action level. So yeah, you can see there, we want to broaden that scope by including those action levels, which were previously are not covered. And it is also for designer, manufacturers, importers, or suppliers or machinery or plant for use at the workplace. Um, so those of you are familiar, familiar with the hierarchy of controls, um, the best control measure is eliminating. So we decided to bring this in because it would be beneficial if those people involved with designing and manufacturing machinery, they can start by reducing noise when they are um, designing whatever plant or machinery they have for the workplace. And then part two is that regulation 4.6 um, shall not apply for a self-employed person. Okay, the exposure of noise, so this is pretty much the same. The only difference is that um, the employer or self-employed person must ensure that no person entering the workplace under their control is exposed to noise at or above the noise action level. So it used to be the noise rating level. Okay, then on information instruction and training, okay, the first part of this, there was quite a lot of changes. Um, yeah, so just getting on with it is that the employer who undertakes work with exposed to an employee to noise, must inform and consult the relevant health and safety representative or health and safety committee established for that workplace of the intention to A, conduct a noise risk assessment, and then B, conduct noise exposure monitoring, and C, training contemplated in regulation 4.3. So that's coming up shortly. Okay, then also the employer who undertakes work which exposes an employee to noise must also inform the relevant health and safety committee or representatives of that workplace of the intention to conduct medical surveillance as well. Um, then the employer must also inform health and safety representatives or the committee of that workplace of the documented outcomes of the noise risk assessment, the noise exposure monitoring, as well as medical surveillance. So that doesn't mean that it's, for the medical surveillance, doesn't mean it's the confidential information, um, yeah. Uh, then moving on to four, an employer must establish for all employees who may be exposed to noise at or above the noise action level, a training program with regards to these regulations. And then the training program must be conducted prior to the placement of the relevant employee. And then the scope of that training program. Okay, so this is the minimum that it needs to cover that training program. So it's the content of scope of the regulations. The potential sources of exposure to noise, if there are any autotoxic chemical agents acting synergistically with noise to cause hearing loss, uh, the potential risk to health and safety caused by exposure to noise, uh, the differing effects of exposure to noise to men, women, young employees and vulnerable employees where such difference exists. So that's when we brought in the gender aspect as what was mentioned earlier and the measures taken by the employer to protect an employee against adverse effects, exposure to noise. Okay. Then G, the necessary for compliance with control, noise control measures in all areas, including the correct use, maintenance, and limitation of hearing protection devices. The precautions to be taken by employees to protect themselves against adverse effects associated with exposure. The noise risk assessment, the purpose of the noise exposure monitoring, and the necessity for medical surveillance, the noise action level and noise rating lim limit for hearing conservation and their meaning, the procedures for reporting, correcting, and replacing defective no con noise control measures, including hearing protection devices, and any additional matters contemplated in regulation five and nine. And then lastly, um, access to records of 
noise risk assessments and noise exposure monitoring, as well as their personal medical records. And then lastly, the fresher training should be conducted annually, and the employer or self-employed person must ensure that mandatories or persons other than the employees who may be affected by noise exposure at the workplace are informed and trained in accordance with um, those requirements that were mentioned earlier in regulation form. And then also the employer must keep a record of employee training in terms of this regulation. So the records part we will get to later for the years there. Okay, so in terms of duties of those exposed, I'm not touching on that because there wasn't any differences from the current um, regulation. Okay, now this uh, new uh, regulation we inserted, uh, duties of designers, manufacturers, importers and suppliers. As I mentioned earlier, we, it would be best if these individuals would reduce noise exposure through plant and machinery before it even gets to the workplace. So the requirements are any designer, manufacturer, importer, supplier of machinery or plant for the use at work must ensure that the machinery or plant minimizes exposure to noise. Supply machinery and plant that can be transported, received, stored and handled in a matter that minimizes exposure to noise. Provide information, instruction and training as deemed necessary to minimize the exposure to noise during the use of plant machinery or plant. And then install machinery or plant in a manner that minimizes the exposure to noise and they also provide information to potential users on the appropriate maintenance of machinery and plant to ensure safe operations and use. Okay, then on to the risk assessment. So some parts um, have changed, uh, some we kept the same. Uh, so the first part is the employer or self-employed person must in respect of a workplace under the control, control cause the noise risk assessment to be done. A, within 60 days of the commencement of that operation and that they after at intervals not exceeding 24 months to determine if any person may be exposed to noise, which is at or above the noise action level. And then if this is a new requirement is that it must be done by a competent person. Okay, then when making the noise risk assessment, contemplates within subregulation one, an employer self-employed person must take into account the following, um, the noise sources to which a person may be exposed, adverse effects that the noise may have on persons, the extent to which a person may be exposed, and the nature of work processes and any reasonable deterioration or in or failure of any control measures. Uh, then E is a new addition, so the present and extent of exposure to autotoxic chemical agents, as well as F as well, the present and extent of exposure to whole body vibration. Then, as mentioned earlier, we bring in the aspect of gender and vulnerability um, because of those IL, IL, ILO conventions. So the risk assessment conducted in terms of subregulation one must take into account specific effects of exposure to men, women, young employees, and vulnerable employees where applicable. And then an employer must, in terms of the noise risk assessment, consider any variation, deviations identified by the noise risk assessment and the proposed recommendations and develop a documented action plan for the implementation of these recommendations. So this is this new regulation is put there because we just don't want employers to do their risk assessment and say so they've done their risk assessment. Um, now we want to actually see what is the actual action plan that the employer is going to implement in order to implement the control measures that they have identified in their risk assessment. And then the employer or self-employed person has forthwith review the risk assessment. Um, if there's any reason to believe that such noise risk assessment is no longer valid, control measures are no longer effective, there's technological or scientific advances allow for more effective control methods, or there's been a significant change in the work methods, the type of work carried out, the type of equipment used to control, and then the review of the noise risk assessment has to be carried out in accordance with 
is regulation seven two and four as well. So that the review part didn't really change too much compared to the current one. Okay, then moving on to noise exposure monitoring. So there the the the, the title has changed as well. Um, so an employer or self-employed person that the employer must ensure that a noise exposure monitoring program at the workplace is implemented where the noise risk assessment or the review of such assessment indicates that any employee may be exposed to noise at or above the noise action level. So it used to be the noise rating level. So now we've made it, we're proposing for the noise action level. Okay, then the noise exposure monitoring program must be carried out in accordance with the provision of these regulations, be carried out by an improved noise inspection authority, and then representatives of employees' exposure to noise, in accordance with Regulation 8.3, which is coming up now. So in order to comply with Regulation 8.2c, the employer must ensure that area noise exposure monitoring is done as contemplated in SANS 1.0083, where a number of employees work in an area of approximate equal noise level. Two, is done as contemplated again in SANS 001-1083, where an employee is working at an approximate fixed location relative to noise source. And then the B part is that noise dosimetry monitoring must be done as contemplated in SANS 1-0083 for employees who do not have a fixed workplace and move around from one position to another and see that peak noise levels are monitored where the noise risk assessment determines that employees may be exposed to impulse noise. So even though noise asymmetry was added to the current regulation, it's now been, the wording for it has now been included into this part of the regulation. And then four, the employer must, in terms of the noise exposure monitoring report, conduct a documented action plan for the implementation of the recommendations so that is again with the similar to the risk assessment is that we don't want employers just to every two years do the noise exposure monitoring report and then every two years you get the same results coming back with the same recommendations so now it is a we are wanting a new requirement where an action plan needs to develop be developed and that needs to be implemented and then the noise exposure monitoring needs to be carried out at least every 20 four months. Okay, medical surveillance, I'm not going to get onto this too much because we have our Dr. George, who was a member of the TC, he will present on the medical surveillance as well as the code of practice, but it's just in short as an employer must establish, maintain and document a system of medical surveillance for all employees exposed to A, so it's noise at or above the noise rating limits, or noise at or above the noise action level where there's a concomitant exposure to autotoxic chemical agents and or whole body vibration. And then as I mentioned, we are introducing a code of practice for medical surveillance for hearing loss, noise induced hearing loss regulations. Okay, the noise zone. Okay, so an employer or self-employed person must ensure that any workplace or part of such workplace is designated as a noise zone where the exposure to noise is at or above the noise action level where there's a concomitant exposure to autotoxic chemical agents and or whole body vibration or two the exposure to noise at or above the noise rating limit and then noise zones is clearly demarcated and identified by signage in accordance with SANS 1186 part one, indicating that the relevant area is a noise zone and that hearing protection devices must be worn. So currently it is not legislated that you need to have a specific sign for a noise zone. So that's where the SANS document comes in. And then see no person enters or remains in a noise zone unless hearing protection devices are worn. Then the control of exposure to noise. So here we are trying to focus on the hierarchy of control for employers to implement. So an employer or self-employed person must ensure that the exposure 
of a person to noise is either prevented or where this is not reasonably practicable, adequately controlled. So in order to do this, an employer or self-employed person must, as far as reasonably practicable, reduce noise exposures to levels below the limits referred to in Regulation 10.1a by implementing a combination of the hierarchy of noise control measures, including a engineering control measures to eliminate or reduce noise at its source, or the modification of the routes by which noise reaches workplaces, the administrative control measures to limit the number of employees exposed and the duration of exposure, and C, the use of hearing protection devices as a last resort if engineering and, and administrative control measures are insufficient. Okay, then also the employer must ensure that an employee who is exposed to noise receives information instruction training as contemplated in Regulation 4 with regard to the correct inspection, use, and reporting of failures of control measures, uh, which, which are supposed to be implemented as above. Okay, then on to hearing protection devices. So where hearing protection devices are provided, employer or self-employed person must ensure that the HPDs reduce exposure to noise to below the noise rating limit or below the noise action level where there's concomitant exposure to autotoxic chemical agents and or whole body vibration. Then they are selected and used and maintained and stored in accordance with SANS 50458. And they're also procured in terms of SANS 1451. So those two additional SANS codes are new inclusions. And then the employer, employee, sorry, must, uh, where there's a requirement to use hearing protection devices, must inspect, use, wear, store, and dispose of HPDs in accordance with any information, training, or lawful instruction given by the employer. B, not intentionally misuse or damage the hearing protection devices. And C, immediately inform the employer of any damaged defect or any need to clean or replace any hearing protection devices. Okay, then moving on to the maintenance of these control measures that have been implemented. So every employer or self-employed person must ensure that any control measure is fully and properly used and maintained in a sufficient state in good working order and good repair and cleanliness. Okay, then moving on to records. So the different records that need to be kept have been increased. And then we've also made the change to the years that the records need to be kept as well for some of the items. So an employer or self-employed person must A, keep records of the reports for training as contemplated in Regulation 4, the noise risk assessment, as well as that action plan from Regulation 7, and the noise monitoring exposure, exposure monitoring, sorry, and that action plan, as well as the medical surveillance records, which is mentioned in the Code of Practice, as well as the maintenance of control measures, which was in Regulation 13. So those are the records that need to be kept. Um, then B, keep records as contemplated in above that 14.1a for 40 years. So all those re records mentioned above should be kept for 40 years and then make records contemplated as above as well available for inspection by an inspector and the relevant health and safety committee or representative. And then if any records are, must be submitted to the Chief Director of Provincial Operations when that employer ceases activity. So also just have to say that we do not provide a definition of what a record is and how it must be maintained. So nowhere does it state that a record needs to be a physical copy of a record. Yeah, I just want to put that through. And then the code of practice. So because we are introducing the code of practice, we have to have a regulation to incorporate it into the, um, the noise induced hearing loss regulations so that it can also be enforceable by the inspectors as well. So just briefly what it says. So the chief inspector may in consultation with the noise technical committee 
develop or review appropriate codes of practice relevant to hearing conservation in the workplace in order to guide and regulate exposure to noise in the workplace. Then moving on to the technical committee part. So you'll also notice in some of our other new regulations, we're introducing a technical committee requirement. So this is a technical committee that the Department of Employment and Labor will establish. And yeah, that technical committee will be constituted of the individuals that I will mention. And then they will have certain responsibilities going forward once um, the regulation has been finally promulgated. So the council must, so that council is referring to the advisory council for occupational health and safety. That's the minister's council. After consultation with the minister, establish a noise technical committee, which must consist of a chairperson designated by the chief inspector from the employees of the Department of Employment and Labor. Then one person designated by the chief inspector from employees of the Department of Labor. Three persons from um, the employer organizations, as well as three persons from employees organizations to represent the federations of unions, then two persons to represent professional bodies recognized by the chief inspector, one person representing higher education institution, one person representing occupational medicine, and then finally, there is an option to co opt an individual to the TC. For if that for a particular when a particular need arises for that spe specialist. Okay, then going on to what the, the requirements of the committee. So the council must appoint a member to the noise technical committee for a period that the council may determine at the time of the appointment. Then after having afforded a member a reasonable opportunity to respond, discharge such a member at any time. For reasons that are fair and just and then also then c is to appoint a new member in the place of the member who is discharged then moving on to the functions of the technical committee so their functions will be to advise the council on noise related matters including but not limited to codes standards and training requirements make recommendations and submit reports to the council regarding any matter to which these regulations apply advise the council regarding any matter referred to the noise technical committee by the council uh, perform any other function for the administration of provision of these regulations that may be required by the council and conduct its work in accordance with the construct instructions and rules of conduct framed by the council so almost done um, with the, the slides. So just moving on to offenses and penalties. So the offenses and penalties are aligned with the what currently the Occupational Health and Safety Act says with regards to offenses and penalties for regulations. So it is still the imprisonment of not more than 12 months or additional fine of 200 Rand for each day. But yeah, the regulations that are Offenses are regulations three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Then the withdrawal of the regulation. So it wasn't an error to write XXX there. So that will only be completed when the final uh, regulation comes out. So we can withdraw the current regulation. And then also the short title is currently referred to as the draft noise and do saving loss regulation of 20XX, but that will also be updated with the final uh, promulgation of the noise and do saving loss regulation. So yeah, those XXs will change in the future. So just moving on to submission of comments. So um, with the regulation that was promulgated, there was a prescribed form that would need to be completed when any comments are submitted. So please um, submit it on that. Um, a word version of that form was also sent through to Sayosh sorry, and other stakeholders. So that would make it easier for yourselves to complete and us and also for us so that we don't have to read bad handwriting. 
And then please also remember that the closing date is the 21st of January, 2023. So that is 90 days after the promulgation. And please send your comments to both myself, Warren, as well as Aluketi. Uh, those are the two email addresses. And yeah, please note that if I do receive it, I will respond. So if I haven't responded in a couple of days or a week or so, please just make a follow up. Um, yeah, because if attachments are too large, then we do have a problem with our emails. But yeah, as soon as I get your comments, I will respond to that email. So again, thank you very much for uh, your attention and to Sayash for allowing me to um, present on the platform. Thank you very much, Warren, for the overview of the draft noise induced hearing loss regulations. Um, I can tell you that unlike some other presentations when the attendees numbers are dropping, um, in fact, in, the, in your case, the numbers has increased. We now have more than 700 attendees on this webinar. So it's obviously an excellent presentation and people are very uh, keen to hear what is the changes and what is the thinking of the department with regards to these draft regulations. Uh, members and uh, attendees, uh, you would have noticed that uh, this draft regulations was published with a code of practice uh, at the same time. Uh, a code of practice uh, is, is a very common uh, thing in the Mine Health and Safety Act and is becoming, uh, I see a common thing now with the uh, regulations under the DEL as well. It's very important because the code of practice actually explains to you uh, how things to be done. Uh, we are fortunate to have on the program this morning, uh, Dr. Robin George, who served, who serves on the technical committee of the Department of Employment and Labor that drafted these draft regulations. And I'm going to call on him now. I see, Doc, you already got your camera on. If you can maybe unmute yourself. Welcome to this webinar. And um, we're looking forward to your presentation on the code of practice on the draft noise and use hearing loss regulations. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Niels, um, Sayosh, um, the Department of Employment and Labor, um, the facilitator for the program. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to represent the technical committee and to address such a large and diverse um, audience with regards to the noise-induced hearing loss code of practice which I will present to you in a few moments. Okay, um, just to get some acknowledgement from um, the facilitator, can you see yes, the slides? Thank you, we can thank you very we much. Can and you, you can hear me, thank you yes, so much. Thank you. So with your permission, I will proceed. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Thank you kindly. So. I think as, as a way of introduction, um, I'm sure that in the presentation that was delivered by Warren so efficiently a few moments ago, and probably my presentation as well on the code of practice, it's going to trigger a whole host of responses and questions and queries from the audience, which we will humbly appreciate. But I think an appeal from my side would be that you bear in mind when you pose your questions or queries that there is hopefully a common objective, both from the technical committee, the Department of Employment and Labor, and yourselves as interested parties to protect the well being of employees in the workplace. And any comment or question that would help us to achieve that objective would be most welcome. So, you can see again, I just want to emphasize the fact that this particular presentation is going to focus on the code of practice for medical surveillance with regards to people who are exposed to noise in the workplace. So, you are already aware of the fact that the Advisory Council um, for Occupational Health and Safety um, to the minister, approved the establishment of a technical committee to review the noise-induced hearing loss regulations, which Warren has so eloquently um, discussed with us 
in terms of the changes. The technical committee resolved to develop a code of practice. This technical committee, you have also already heard from Warren and he's given more details as to the constitution of this technical committee and the various stakeholders who make up the technical committee. And it is because of the complex nature of medical surveillance with respect to people who are exposed to noise in the workplace that the technical committee resolved to draft a code of practice for medical surveillance for people exposed to noise-induced hearing loss. The code of practice itself, we believe, would be able to facilitate a proactive approach to medical surveillance for people exposed to noise. And this is particularly with regards to audiometric testing. Okay, and we've put all of these requirements that need to be addressed and fulfilled into one document. Warren has already indicated that the code of practice has now been incorporated into the draft noise-induced hearing loss regulations through Regulation 15. To emphasize the importance of the code of practice in terms of its objective, it is to assist employers with the development and implementation of a medical surveillance program for employees exposed to noise in the workplace. The scope of the code of practice will be aligned with the scope of application of the noise-induced hearing loss regulations, which Warren has fleshed out in his presentation. But just to emphasize, it is really for employers or self-employed persons in any workplace under their control where persons are exposed to continuous or impulse noise at or above the applicable noise action level, and by that we mean at or above 82 decibels, which is the eight hour rating level for continuous noise, or at or above 135 decibels, which is the peak noise level for impulse noise. In terms of the medical surveillance, you will see that in the draft noise induced, reg uh, um, noise -induced hearing loss regulations, Medical surveillance is addressed in Regulation 9. And it states that an employer must establish, maintain, and document a system of medical surveillance. This medical surveillance program must be a planned, ongoing program of audiometric testing, including baseline, entry, initial, periodic, and exit audiometry. Now, you may see that there are one or two items there that may or may not be familiar to you. We have decided in the code of practice to try to bring clarity to what we mean by each of those particular um, words or, or requirements in terms of audiometric testing, or you could call them categories of audiometric testing for that matter. And the medical surveillance program must be implemented under the guidance of an occupational medicine practitioner. <clears throat> okay, so in terms of audiometry, I'm sorry, the word audiometry or audiometric testing above there has been screened out on my side. I hope you can see it. But in terms of the code of practice and the noise induced hearing loss regulations, audiometric testing must be conducted on all employees exposed to noise at or above the noise action level, which has been defined, where there is concomitant exposure to autotoxic chemical agents and or whole body vibration, or in the case where there is not concomitant exposure to autotoxic chemicals or whole body vibration, then audiometric testing must be conducted on all employees exposed to noise at or above the noise rating limit. And the noise rating limit has been defined, but just to re-emphasize, 
the noise rating limit for continuous noise is 85 decibels and for impulse noise it is 137 decibels. I emphasize that the audiometric testing must include the following categories, baseline, entry, initial, periodic, and exit audiometry, but more detail about each of those later. And it must be conducted by a competent person. And that competent person has been defined in the draft noise-induced hearing loss regulations. I'm not going to repeat the definition here. So in terms of the categories where audiometric testing is required, we will start off with the baseline audiometry. Now, much of what I'm going to say here already exists in the current set of regulations, okay? But there may be one or two little changes which you will probably be realize and, and will probably again trigger quite a lot of response from you. So the baseline audiometric test must be conducted before or within 30 days of deployment or entry into an environment where there is potential exposure to noise. So in other words, if a person is going to be deployed into a workspace, which is demarcated as a noise zone, and this will be the first time a person has ever been exposed to noise, then a baseline audiometric test will be required to be conducted. A baseline audiometric test is a once-off test and that should be conducted on every employee who is deployed or enters into an environment where there is potential exposure to noise, as I've said, for the first time in their work life span. And that baseline audiometric test will be the baseline for the rest of that particular employee's work life. The baseline audiometric test must be conducted to establish two things. One, a baseline PLH, which will serve as a reference against which all future PLH shifts will be compared. And, and this is a new inclusion, the baseline should be used to establish an audiometric zero for the purpose of calculating standard threshold shifts against which all future standard threshold shifts will be compared. And I'm sure by now all of you are jumping to your computers to type in questions or queries and so on. The PLH is essentially used to determine whether people have reached a stage of hearing loss where they would probably require compensation for noise-induced hearing loss. And we believe that that is not enough to prevent noise-induced hearing loss. So the audiometric zero, in terms of the standard threshold shift and the calculations of standard threshold shifts from the audiometric zero, is an inclusion that we believe will address the objective of preventing noise-induced hearing loss way before it becomes a compensable situation. And we believe that it is probably justifiable to mirror what is happening in the mining environment with regards to their use of the standard threshold shift as a preventative tool or intervention to deal with noise-induced hearing loss and the prevention thereof. Now, with regards to the audiometric zero and the standard threshold shift, we believe that it is correct that an employee employed before the promulgation of these revised or the new noise-induced regulations will require a baseline audiometric test to establish the audiometric zero against which all future standard threshold shifts will be compared. So what do we mean by that? Because of the existing noise-induced hearing loss regulations, okay, promulgated in 2003, there was already a requirement for baseline audiometric tests to be done to establish the baseline PLH. And we believe that any employee 
we has been working and is still working in the NOI zone and has hopefully complied with that particular requirement will now require an additional baseline to establish the audiometric zero. And this is towards preventing future hearing loss. The baseline audiometric test to establish the audiometric zero for those employees who are currently working in the noise zone, okay, must be conducted within 24 months after the promulgation of the draft or, 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 or sorry, the finalized noise-induced hearing loss regulations, whenever that will be. The baseline audiometric test must comply with reliability and validity criteria. And the reliability criteria, I'm not necessarily going to go through the entire list here, but these reliability criteria are contained in SANS 10083. And the validity criteria are those criteria as contained in instruction 171, which is a supplement uh, 171 and, and SANS 10083. And I think most of you are familiar with the requirements in terms of re reliability and validity. So I'm not going to um, go into detail there and go through the entire list. Of course, and I've already alluded to this, that um, once the, a valid baseline, a valid baseline has been established, then the audiogram with the lowest PLH of the two audiograms will be regarded as the baseline PLH for that employee. And that audiogram will be regarded as the baseline audiogram for that particular employee. Again, I don't think I'm saying anything new to what everyone is probably already familiar with. Now, in terms of the existing noise-induced hearing loss regulations, and the same would apply to the revised noise-induced hearing loss regulations, where a screening audiometric test is unable to establish a valid baseline, the screening test must be repeated after another interval of 16 hours without the use of hearing protective devices. And if after that, you are still unable to establish a valid baseline audiometric test, the employee must be referred to an audiologist to establish a valid baseline audiometric test. And as far as possible, this process should be completed within a 30-day deadline, as referred to earlier. This is important. It applies at the moment for PLH and baseline audiometry to establish a PLH, and it will apply in the new regulations as well, that where a valid baseline test has not been established. So for the old regulation, if it was not established between the period 1 May 2001 and 16 November 2003, okay, or now for new employees deployed into an environment with exposure to noise after 2003, if within those time frames it was not able to establish a valid baseline audiometric test to determine the baseline PLH, the baseline PLH will be considered to be 0%. So forgive me for, for putting it to you in a very long-winded way, but I, I think it was important for you to understand um, exactly what we're getting at here. In terms of the audiometric zero, where there is a failure to establish an audiometric zero within 24 months from the promulgation of the new regulations, the audiometric zero for each year will be considered as zero. As I said, I expect quite a lot of vigorous interaction and engagement on these points. Now, any employee who starts work in a noise zone during a 24 month period, okay, after the promulgation of the new 
noise-induced hearing loss regulations will require a baseline audiometric test, which will, by implication, establish the baseline PLH and audiometric zero. The next category is the entry audiometric test. I'm gonna read this, what it means. An entry audiometric test must be conducted on every employee previously exposed to noise who is deployed or enters a new environment with potential exposure to noise. And the employer must use this entry audiometric test to establish PLA shifts from baseline, standard threshold shifts against the audiometric zero, and preventative interventions and reporting needs, and also the need for referral for diagnostic audiology. Okay, so a couple of points. <clears throat> a person may well have had a baseline audiometric test and periodic audiometric tests, which we will be coming to. But if this particular individual exits from a workplace or employer and is redeployed or employed with a new employer and enters into a noise zone, then for the new employer, an entry audiometric test will have to be done to achieve the objectives listed here. And I think that it will protect the new employer, but probably also the employee as such, if these particular requirements are met. And that is the entry audiometric test. The, audio, uh, the entry audiometric test must also comply with reliability and validity criteria, which are very similar to what has already been mentioned. But in the case of an entry audiometric test, you will see under validity criteria, only one audiogram is in fact required. The requirement that it must be conducted after at least 16 hours free from any noise exposure will still apply. And it should be conducted before within 30 days of deployment into an environment where the person may be exposed to noise for a new employer. So the initial audiometric test, an initial audiometric test, it says must be conducted on every employee exposed to noise where there is no valid baseline and or valid entry audiometric test. So you have a situation where sometimes people have been employed for a period where they have not had a baseline audiometric test nor an entry audiometric test. And we believe that it is absolutely prudent and justifiable that those employees should also, for their protection and probably for the employer's protection as well, that those employees should be subjected to an initial audiometric test. Of course, if there has been no baseline audiometric test done, we have now established that their baseline PLH would be regarded as zero and that their audiometric zero, uh, yes, their, 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 their um, audiometric zero, as far as the standard threshold shift is concerned, will be considered as zero for each year. Now, the initial audiometric test will be used to establish PLH shifts from baseline the standard threshold shift comparison with the audiometric zero. And then of course, to determine whether preventative interventions and reporting are, are necessary and also whether there's a need for referral for diagnostic audiology. And we will say a little bit more about those in a little while. And similarly, there will be reliability and validity criteria that needs to be met um, when you perform an initial audiometric test, and that would be similar to the criteria for the entry audiometric test. Periodic audiometry. A periodic audiometric test must be conducted on every employee exposed to noise. And the periodic audiometric test must be conducted 
every 12 months for exposures at or above 82 decibels with concomitant exposure to ototoxic chemicals or whole body vibration or at or above 85 decibels but less than um, 105 decibels um, where there is no concomitant exposure to ototoxic chemicals and whole body vibration. It needs to be uh, conducted every six months for exposures at or above 105 decibels. And of course, if there is a recommendation based on clinical judgment by an occupational health practitioner, occupational medicine practitioner, for it to be conducted at more frequent intervals, then that recommendation would have to be implemented. The reliability and validity criteria will apply here as well. But to note that in the case of the periodic audiometry testing, that provided that the correct wearing of hearing protective devices that complies with the relevant parts of SANS 1541, while performing work in a noise zone prior to the audiometric test, this must be deemed as meeting the 16 hour period free from noise exposure. The next category is diagnostic audiology. A diagnostic audiometric test must be conducted on all employees exposed to noise where the screening audiometric test identifies a PLH shift of more than 10% from baseline and that the hearing loss pattern is suggestive of noise-induced hearing loss. Validity and reliability criteria once again applies. Um, important to note here that in terms of diagnostic audiology, it must be conducted by a competent person and, and that competent person has been defined in the draft regulations, okay? But it essentially would uh, be either an audiologist or an ear, nose and throat specialist. It must be two audiometric tests conducted after a period of at least 24 hours free from any noise exposure without the use of hearing protective devices must be conducted on the same day. So each test must be on the same day. And the two diagnostic audiometric tests should not differ by more than 10 decibels at any frequency used to determine the PLH. And again, I think those, those requirements are essentially the same as what currently exists in the noise-induced hearing loss regulations. The next category is your exit audiometric testing. An exit audiometric test must be conducted on every employee who was exposed to noise when that employee's employment is terminated. We have recommended that this should be conducted before within seven days of the date of termination of employment. Now, should an, an audiometric test conducted within six months, so this is a periodic audiometric test, if it was conducted within six months, prior to the date of termination of employment, that audiometric test can be considered as fulfilling the requirements of an exit audiometric test. So the exit audiometric test will also help to establish a PLH shift from baseline. Um, it will help us to establish the standard threshold shift against the audiometric zero, and also to establish the need for reporting and potentially the need for referral for diagnostic audiology. And similar reliability and validity criteria as set out um, in the code above will apply. Um, again, I can't see the heading here, but with regards to the standard threshold shift, now we're talking here about um, the interventions or actions that need to be taken when there are shifts um, with regards to the standard threshold shift from the audiometric zero. And 
where the shift is between 10 decibels and 25 decibels in one or both ears, the case must be referred to an occupational medicine practitioner for review. The shift must be reported to the employer um, and or the health and safety committee and or the health and safety representative. It should trigger an investigation to be conducted by the employer to determine what the reasons for the shift are and also to determine the effectiveness of the hierarchy of controls, including hearing protective devices, which would be the last resort in the hierarchy of controls. The employer would have an additional responsibility to retrain an employee concerned in terms of regulation four of the noise-induced hearing loss regulations that Warren has fleshed out in detail earlier. And there will be a determination by an occupational medicine practitioner with regards to the frequency of subsequent periodic audiometric tests for an employee concerned. Where the standard threshold shift reaches 25 decibels or more than 25 decibels, then in addition to the above interventions, the employee must be referred for diagnostic audiology as well. And where the diagnostic audiology confirms a shift of 25 decibels or more in terms of the standard threshold shift, then the occupational medicine practitioner must report that shift to the chief inspector of the Department of Employment and Labor. And, and, and that will be with regards to section 25 of the um, Occupational Health and Safety Act. Now, in terms of reporting with regards to the PLH, where screening audiometry identifies a PLH shift of 10% or more from baseline, then the case must be referred to the occupational medicine practitioner for review and for further case management. The employee must be referred for diagnostic audiology on the recommendation of the occupational medicine practitioner and in accordance with the required instructions and regulations and so on. Where diagnostic audiology confirms a PLA shift of more than 10% or of 10% or more uh, from baseline with a noise induced hearing loss pattern, then the case must be reported to the employer to the chief inspector of the Department of Employment and Labor, and the employer must report the case to the compensation commissioner. The employer will be required to conduct an investigation to determine the reasons for this PLA shift and the effectiveness of the control measures um, that have been implemented. And again, the frequency of the subsequent periodic audiometric tests will be uh, determined by an occupational medicine practitioner who will present recommendations. The date of the diagnostic audiometric test confirming a shift in PLH from baseline that exceeds 10% must be regarded as the date of the diagnosis of compensable noise-induced hearing loss. You could put that in another way and say that that would be the date of confirmation of an occupational disease of noise-induced hearing loss. Warren has already spoken about the requirement to keep records. Um, I'm not going to go through this list. Um, it's there already. Um, just bear in mind that we're reasonably practical and relevant, a new employee should provide a copy of their baseline audiometric test if it is available, if it was done. And an employee must be provided with a copy of the baseline audiometric test plus a copy of the exit audiometric test upon termination of employment. That is the end of my presentation. 
Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you once again for the opportunity to address all of you. Um, I'm sure that there are many, many, many questions. Um, I will now um, revert back to um, our coordinator, Niels. Thank you kindly. Thank you very much, Dr. George. Um, very well presented, clear, and to the point. Um, I think, as I indicated uh, before I called on you, that I think this is more important part because it tells you how to do uh, the what is prescribed in the in the regulations or will be prescribed. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can ask you to just leave your camera on because we are moving over now to the uh, Q and A's. I just want to remind the members online that to please post your questions in the Q and A, obviously relative to the to these uh, draft regulations. I want to compliment the the team from the Department of Employment and Labour that has up until now successfully answered. 68 questions. Uh, there's still some 10 there to, to be looked at. And I see Elise did indicate that there's some of the questions that she would like you, uh, doctor, to, to answer live. So Elise, if we can maybe start with those, and if I can call on you to maybe just read them out and, 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 and ask if Do uh, Dr. Jaws can answer them maybe one by one, and then we can go to the general questions as well, uh, which I'm sure Warren and yourself and the team will like to answer live as well. So over to you with those que specific questions to Dr. George. Thanks, Elise. Just uh, unmute yourself. So you're still muted. There we go. There we go. Cool. Let me just open the Q and A again. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Dr. George, I think most of these you will be able to assist us with. So I'm just gonna just gonna find them. Okay, so maybe the first one, uh, Warren, or maybe Dr. George, it's up to you. Can we get an explanation of the difference between the writing in the action level and the the noise writing level? So this question actually came up quite a few times with regards to the difference to the uh, 82 dBA and the 85 dBA. If, if we can just have an explanation with regards to the, the reasoning behind those two levels, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. Good question. Um, I invite Warren to come in when he feels necessary. Um, so as you would have seen in, in both presentations, we've alluded to these two levels. Okay, one being the action level and the other one being the noise rating level. Now, previously, there was only one level, and that was the noise rating level, which was set at 85 decibels for continuous noise exposure. We as a technical committee, through our deliberations and research, we have noted that it was probably not correct to have ignored the fact that where people are exposed to noise and concomitantly exposed to ototoxic chemicals and or whole body vibration in the workplace, that such people may develop hearing loss much earlier than if they were only exposed to noise. And that was the main reason why we decided to address those employees who are exposed to ototoxic chemicals and, whole, and or whole body vibration together with, no, with noise at a much earlier stage because of the higher risk of them developing hearing loss. And that was the basis for setting an action level of 82 decibels for continuous noise and 135 decibels for impulse noise. Um, Warren, you are free to come in and add anything if you if you have more to add. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. George. Yeah, so on what you said, so as we all mentioned previously, the presentations that um, the department wants to become a lot more preventative with regards to noise, because unfortunately noise is still a big issue in our workplaces in South Africa. So, we need to start catching and 
catching employees at an earlier stage, as Dr. George said. And by one way of doing that is broadening the scope of where these regulations will be applicable. You can't see me cool. Um, so yeah, that's where we brought in the action level. So now, yeah, not everyone will be affected by that action level, but there might be those employees that are a bit more vulnerable, as we mentioned earlier, or in those employees as well who are exposed to whole body vibration as well as autotoxic chemicals. So we can now catch those employees earlier on before they get um, noise-induced hearing loss. Thank you. I think just the last little comment on this matter, it, it's also for this reason that when the risk assessments are conducted, okay, the requirement to actually um, identify those employees who are exposed to autotoxic chemicals and or whole body vibration becomes extremely important. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. So it's from Karen stating, if a current employee has a valid baseline under the current regulations, yes. can those values be used as audiometric zero? Um, Dr. George, if you want to take that. Thank you. So the, if a person has a valid baseline in terms of determining the baseline PLH, all right, um, under the existing noise-induced hearing loss regulations, unfortunately, the way we have structured the code of practice and the noise-induced um, regulations, the, the, the new noise-induced hearing loss regulations, that baseline will unfortunately not um, uh, fulfill the requirement to establish an audiometric zero. The, the employee concerned would have to have a new baseline specifically to establish the audiometric zero. But the baseline PLH for that employee will still be the, the PLH established by the baseline that was performed under the existing noise-induced hearing loss regulations. And in the code of practice, we have said that such an employee would in fact need to have a baseline to establish the audiometric zero within a 24-month period from the promulgation of the new noise-induced hearing loss regulations. Right, thank you. Then we have a question with actually two parts. So firstly, why should the audiometric test be conducted after 18, oh, sorry, my screen jumped there. Let me just get back there. Why should the automatic test be conducted after 16 hours prior to the use of HPDs? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is how does the HPDs affect the testing? Okay, um, Warren, before I jump in, um, I'm going to give you an opportunity now, maybe, um, if you want to say something, and then I will gladly answer. Uh, no, Dr. George, I think you are the, the specialist okay. in, in that field. Thanks. All right, so um, the reason that we have insisted that people um, for certain categories of audiometric testing um, that they should be tested following a period of 16 hours free from noise exposure. Um, probably most of you would be aware that when people are exposed to noise, okay, it can impact on the hearing. And I'm going to use very simplistic terminology now. It can impact on the hearing in such a way that when the test is done, in the absence of a person having been free from noise exposure, whether they were wearing um, hearing protection or not, um, that the hearing thresholds at each of the frequencies considered in the audiometric test could be affected to such an extent that we get an inaccurate determination of the person's actual hearing loss. And that could be a disadvantage to both employee and to employer. So I think that's a very simplistic explanation as to why we want people to be free from exposure for a period of, of 16 hours. Um, 
when it comes to periodic audiometry testing, we have only made one little difference there. And that is that in those cases where the person has been wearing hearing protective devices prior to the audiometric test, that that will be accepted as mirroring a period of 16 hours free from noise exposure without hearing protective devices. But the objective for that requirement is to ensure that we get an accurate as possible determination of the person's hearing thresholds therefore the PLH, and also for that matter, in, in, in the case now for the um, audiometric zero and the determination of standard threshold shifts. Right, thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> I've got two more, and the last one I think that is for, in your ballpark. Um, so Zolewa is saying that I'm a bit uneasy with my understanding between the PLH shift of 10% and the STS of 25. Please clarify with the similarity or differences between these two. Yes, um, there are most definitely differences. So the PLH um, as, as a determination of hearing loss is utilized more from a compensation point of view Whereas the introduction of the standard threshold shift, okay, is going to be utilized as a preventative tool. Now, when it comes to the PLH, there are certain action levels in terms of interventions that have to be implemented. And the one would be the shift from baseline, and we're talking PLH now, the shift from baseline of more than 10%, which will trigger, amongst other things, a need for referral for diagnostic audiology. Whereas when it comes to the standard threshold shift, and I'm gonna say something more when, I, when, I, when I've made the comment now, because I think this is very important. When it comes to the standard threshold shift, the calculation of the standard threshold shift will follow a specific formula and when the standard threshold shift exceeds 25 decibels using your question, that will trigger an intervention which amongst others will include a need to report such a case to the chief inspector of the Department of Employment and Labor. So it has nothing to do with compensation. It's got to do with prevention. And why to, to, to report this to the Department of Employment and Labor? Because it will probably trigger a reaction from the Chief Inspectorate of the Department of Employment and Labor to focus on that particular employer or company because it may be an indication that there are matters that need to be addressed in terms of exposing people to um, noise in the workplace. Now, the calculation of the standard threshold shift. I, what I'm going to say now, I'm probably addressing it to the panelists, including myself and the technical committee members who are not on the panel today, but are probably in the audience and Warren himself. I think we possibly owe it to um, everybody involved in this field to introduce a bit of blurb on the calculation of the standard threshold shift, Warren. I noted, Dr. George. Thank we'll you very much. Okay. When we get yeah. to our meeting. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Although it's actually quite yeah, easy right, if thanks. you've done if you've done primary school maths, which is much more than I have done in my lifetime, you should be able to calculate it. Okay. So it's not really a train smash. Okay. Thank you. Let's hope so, Doctor. <laughs> then I think, Warren, this is one that you you could answer. So does the noise reduction rating, the NRR, I assume this is on the uh, hearing protection devices, does the noise reduction rating the same as the noise reduction limit, or is there a difference? 
Okay, so the correct terminology is noise reduction rating, which is NRR or there's also SNR. It's just one is American and one is European. So the correct terminology is noise reduction rating. So that is how much the HPDs are reduce exposure, um, reduce the level of noise exposure. So yes, that is the, that's the correction on there. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, then, Niels. Those are the few that I've um, highlighted. I just picked out for on a answering. If you want to take over, thank, thank you, Elise. Um, Warren, perhaps we can, without passing the buck, maybe we can move on to what we agreed uh, at the start. Um, there are still a number of questions that can be answered. Uh, I think I'll leave it at your discretion to maybe just. Um, go over them, um, read them out, just give a short answer, or if you see that it's not appropriate, just go to the next one, and then obviously your team can uh, help and answer. I, I think that you and, and Dr. George will answer most of them. So maybe um, if I can ask you to have a look at them, I'm, I'm certainly not going to read them all out because it might be not appropriate questions in, in your view. So if I can ask you to please facilitate that. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, I'll just start at the top. Um, yeah, so the first one from Armory Bush. Um, if I understand correctly, all personnel will have to have a baseline test done. And then depending on the noise levels, if differ in different sections, they must be tested again for the new levels. Um, I'm not quite sure what she means by the new levels. Um, Dr. George, do you maybe understand that question? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to answer it in, in a manner that, that hopefully um, can assist the, the individual to ask the question. Um, so the, the existing noise-induced hearing loss regulations would have required a baseline to be conducted to establish a baseline PLH. And those requirements will persist into the new regulations. But there's an additional requirement now, and that is to determine an audiometric zero. Now, to determine an audiometric zero will require a baseline test to be done. In some instances, you will, you will determine from your understanding of what we've discussed today that that will be a new baseline to establish the standard threshold, uh, the, the audiometric zero, against which future standard threshold shifts will be determined. It will not be necessary to determine a new baseline PLH because the existing baseline where that was done will still be applicable. But there will be other instances where an employee, for example, who is employed into a noise zone for the first time in their working life, that particular individual will require a baseline audiometric test, which in this case will serve the dual purpose of determining the baseline PLH and the audiometric zero for each year. I hope that that adds a little bit more clarity. Okay, thank you, Dr. George. Um, Sorry, I just want to, I'm not going to read this one out, but I'm just going to mention the person's name because it's a bit of a person, he's giving personal information. But if Shane Rue is still here and listening, um, I suggest that you either pop me an email or contact your nearest um, Department of Employment and Labor office so that um, Either the, the person from compensation in the province can assist you or an inspector can go to um, the email address. Um, yeah, I will send you my email address, Shane. I see you asked it quickly. Okay, then going back up to the top, Dr. George, um, if there is a PLA, 
HS of more than 10% and there's no P noise induced hearing loss pattern, can the OMP choose not to send for diagnostic test? Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that makes absolute sense. Um, and, and I think I emphasized in my presentation that where the PLH shift from baseline exceeds 10%, okay, that that will trigger a possible need for referral by the occupational medicine practitioner to whom that case should have been referred for review and further guidance that the occupational medicine practitioner will make a determination that if the shift is more than 10% from baseline and it mirrors a noise-induced hearing loss pattern, then it would justify referral for diagnostic audiology. Hearing loss is not only caused by exposure to noise. Hearing loss can be caused by many, many other factors, which could result in a PLH determination that exceeds a shift of more than 10% from baseline. But the pattern of the hearing loss may be apparent to the occupational medicine practitioner that it does not resemble a noise-induced hearing loss pattern. And for that reason, the occupational medicine practitioner may make a determination that instead of referring the person for diagnostic audiology, the person perhaps first needs to be seen by um, an, an ear, nose, and throat specialist, and further recommendations on case management will be made following the submission and review of the ear, nose, and throat specialist report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. George. Um, maybe I just want to, before we go on, I just want to make a comment that this isn't a final regulation. Absolutely. So if people have comments, I'm sorry to say, but there's no point of just putting in a comment here in, the, in this Q&A. We need to officially receive that prescribed form where comments need to receive so we can make an official record of it. And then our technical committee can address it um, appropriately. I'd also like to suggest that if you do make a comment, please come up with a suggestion as well. Don't just say, don't do this, or this, what you wrote is not applicable or not appropriate. Please also then come up with your own suggestion because when if we don't get those suggestions and in two years time or so, when we do have a final regulation, then it's too late then to address those comments. So that's why we are doing this um, public comment phase and these webinars with our stakeholders so that um, yeah, we can sort out these issues before there is a final document. Okay, um, so just moving on, the next one at the top. Warren, there. sorry, thanks Warren. Yeah. I just want to quickly, sorry to interrupt, uh, valid comment. Uh, I, was, I was going to suggest it as well. Um, when you go through the questions, obviously some of them were posted uh, way back maybe, and some of them even an hour ago. Just at your own discretion, read, if you want to read it, just say this has been answered already, uh, either by the doctor or in your presentation. So don't, we don't have to actually take every single question and re-answer it if it has been answered. I leave it yeah. at your discretion, thanks. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Nils, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just mention there was a few comments about competent person. And again, people asking if their particular profession will be deemed competent. So our standard answer from the department is that we do not say who is competent. That is up to the employer to decide who is competent for their workplace, depending on um, what industry they're in, what sector, and what are the specific hazards in their workplace. So the department has drafted that competent person guideline, which is available on our website. And I'm sure Sayosh also has copies of it from our previous regulations and webinars. So yeah, employers and as well as the people who are going to be appointed as a competent person, um, they need to consult that document as well. Um, okay, yeah, so there are, there's 31 questions, but I did go through some of them that, yeah, some of them were provided a while ago. Um, 
There's people in the chat is now popping up. Okay, so there's one question. I see good morning from Alison Bob. Good morning. My question is on occupational hygiene surveys for noise. After risk assessment has determined that there are no hazard posing a risk as per the ratings, can this be discussed at the stat committee meeting and documented that two yearly surveys are not required? This will be monitored, and if the environment activities change, then the requirements for the two year surveys will be reviewed. So, I think, Alison, you have kind of answered your own question there. So, I don't know what that stat committee meeting is, but yeah, everything goes about your risk assessment, and your risk assessment will determine then further if you need to do uh, exposure monitoring or medical surveillance and implementation of controls and so on. Um, yeah, there are quite a few questions about STS and the audiometric zero. Um, I see there's one from David Barnes. Uh, the draft regulations have confused the concept of audiometric zero as used in OSHA, America. This then means in our draft that it is much more difficult to be reportable in South Africa than in the USA. Uh, US OSHA reports then STS less than 10, the first step, and HL average greater than 15, second, audiometric testing. The bottom line is that very few employees, specific contractors, or those who move jobs frequently will ever be able in terms, reportable in terms of this draft. The draft therefore does not assist providing guidance as an early lag indicator. So again, David, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't like it, please submit a comment and suggest to us how we can improve. Um, yeah, but as I said earlier as well, and I think it was mentioned previously that we, yes, we do look at international requirements that other countries have, not only for noise, but when we're reviewing all our other legislation, but most of those countries are first world countries or highly developed countries. So unfortunately, South Africa is not in that situation and we need to um, kind of adapt it to our socioeconomic situation in South Africa. So yes, it would be nice to copy some other countries exactly, but we need to take into consideration um, South Africa and our particular working environment. Um, there are, have been a few questions with regards to where this regulation is applicable and also in the mining sector. Um, so again, I want to say that, yeah, these regulations under the, uh, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So in that act, it defines what a workplace is. And then it also says what is excluded from a workplace. So one of those sectors is the mining sector. So therefore, this regulation and this code of practice will not be applicable in those sectors that are excluded in the OSH Act. It's only those that fall under the OSH Act will these be um, applicable. Okay. Um, someone said, will the STS baseline be once off or repeated at every employer? Dr. George, if you can come in there. I think the, the baseline for the um, establishment of the audiometric zero will be um, a once-off, essentially. <clears throat> but when it comes to the reporting, in other words, where there has been a shift of more than 25 decibels, that's your standard threshold shift. If that is the case, and the employer has addressed all the reporting requirements, then the values established at that particular juncture, okay, and, and, and now I'm going to confuse you even more when it comes to the, the average um, year in loss across certain frequencies and and this is where it's going to be important for us to provide you with information on how this calculation is done but essentially maybe to avoid too much confusion at the point 
where the standard threshold shift has exceeded 25 decibels and that case has been reported, then that particular audiogram will serve as the individual's new audiometric zero. So in other words, shifts will be determined against that new audiometric zero and only if there has been a further standard threshold shift of more than 25 decibels will reporting to the chief inspector be necessary again. And I think it follows a similar principle because if we look at PLH, for example, okay, where the PLH shift from baseline has been confirmed by an audiologist to exceed 10% and it's noise induced hearing loss and it must be submitted for compensation, then that particular audiometric test and PLH will be considered as the person's new baseline PLH. So submission for compensation will only then be required if there has been a further shift of more than 10%. So I think we kind of following a similar principle there. I hope I hope that makes it clear for you. Okay, thank you, Dr. George. Um, maybe just if you can People have been asking about the calculation of the audiometric zero and mm. like mm. existing. Can you maybe just clarify the machine, the audio, the, the device does all of that? Or so as far as far as I am aware, you you probably gonna find varying situations, but I, I am absolutely confident that the um, new hardware in terms of audiometers and also the software those can be set up to, in fact, do the calculation um, in an automated fashion. Okay, thank you for that. Um, yeah, there was a couple that were, um, yeah, that were related to. That. So people would have to inquire from their service provider supplier whether existing machines can be. Um, updated with additional software to incorporate the standard threshold shift and an automated calculation or whether it would require um, procurement of new machinery and software. And listen, um, let me say at the outset, if, if, if that's going to be necessary for some people, we, we come across as being very humble and apologetic, but you do understand that there is a broader uh, um, objective and that broader objective is the protection of the well-being of people in the workplace, particularly with regards to preventing um, noise-induced hearing loss. So there's going to be a little bit of discomfort and pain that certain stakeholders are going to have to endure at various points. Our apology for that. Yeah, I also think I've picked up that um, employees can also consult their, their OMPs, their OHPs, their occupational health nursing practitioners about all of this Absolutely. when the time comes or Absolutely. in the meantime. Yeah. So it's not that we don't have the answers here, but we, we can't answer every little question Absolutely. everyone has with regards to all of these. There are other experts in the field, not only sure. the two of us presenting. That, um, yeah, that are able to explain this to employers as well as employees. So yeah, maybe that's also just another comment to, to make as well. Um, okay, so yeah, there is still 20 open and it's quite a lot to... Um, okay, so someone asked on a follow-up on a question, I don't know what that was. Um, where the regulations refer to persons, then that will include students in a tertiary education. So, yeah, so an employer, they will obviously do their risk assessment. And if they identify that there is noise in their workplace, remember, a in this instance, a university is still a workplace for those members employed or those individuals employed by the university. So yes, they would also have to take into account exposure to 
people other than their employees at that particular workplace. So that won't only be specific for um, tertiary institution, but any person, any visitor that goes to any employer where there is noise, they will have to take that into account. Um, there's another one from, I think, Clinton Kutcher. If an employee started working at the age of 18 and had a PLH of 1.1% and at age 35, he joins your company, at the age of 35 and does a baseline medical for your company and has a PRH of 8,8% 8, will the new employer monitor his PRH of 8.8% going forward so only if the PRH is 18.8 .8 under your employment could it then have to be reported to COIDA Okay, is my understanding correct or not? So yeah, this question we also get with regards to the yeah. current regulations. So I think the standard answer is you only have one baseline in your whole employment. So there was a similar question earlier by someone else. So in that example that the individual gave, if he went to his new employer and the new employer now said it is um, eight point. 8% as soon as the next test reveals that it is more than it is 10% from that baseline, which was 1.1, that employer would need to report it straight away. So it's not 10% from that new employer's entry baseline audiogram. But I think Warren, if I could, if I could add to that, um, obviously the new employer will only be liable for the extent of the year in loss that was experienced by the employee concerned while employed by the new employer. And in fact, it is for that reason that we advocate that when a person joins a new employer, that the new employer should do an entry audiometric test because the new employer would be able to submit to the compensation commissioner together with the baseline, okay, the entry audiometric PLH so that the compensation commissioner would be able to determine where liability lies or what fraction or percentage of the liability exists with the new employer when a person is submitted for compensation. I hope that makes sense. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. George. And also, I can say when when an inspector goes to the workplace to conduct that investigation, they will also then ask the current employer for that employee's particular employment history. Absolutely. And then go schedule appointments for those other employers to find Absolutely. out what was being done at those workplaces as well. Um, sorry, I'm just writing a answering one question typing as well um right someone someone asked do medicals get performed with or audiometric tests been get performed with or without hearing aids yeah <laughs> that, that that that's a very 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 interesting question so the reality is that People do all kinds of things at the moment, okay? Um, I've seen tests where, where it's reported that the audiometric test was done with hearing protection, excuse me, hearing aids and without hearing aids and so on. Um, Warren, you can come in here. I, I don't think that I've seen any regulation where it states one way or the other. I'm not sure that, that yeah. there's a regulated requirement with regards to this. No, I, I'm not aware of it either, Dr. George. So, so that's a very difficult one. And, and maybe it is something. So to the person who posed the question, um, I think this is a very good question. And I think what we will offer you is to take this back to the technical committee and, and have a vigorous debate amongst the technical committee people and throw it out to a wider audience of specialists if necessary as well. 
Um, so I'm I'm going to um, probably not attempt to give you a definitive answer now. Let's take this back to the, to the technical committee. Thank you for a very yeah. good question. Yeah, thank you for the answer as well, Dr. George. Um, someone's also asking um, if an employee has been exposed to noise at a previous employer, then his baseline PRH is 21%, qualifies him for compensation with the new employer. The previous employer has closed down. Who's supposed to assist this employee with completing their compensation form? So. If that person, that new employer should assist that employee in submitting the claim and then, um, yeah, the compensation commissioner will address it accordingly. Um, yeah, as, yeah. So also that previous employer as required by the current regulation, they were also where they were supposed to submit all their records to the Department of Labor, wherever they are, whichever province they're in to the Chief um, Director of Provincial Operations. And yeah, so the employer should have also done that as well. Um, how many we still got? We still got 16. Um, At your discretion, Warren. Yeah. Now, there's a few, okay, someone also asked, Esmeralda, is the need for two tests for a pre-employment as noted in the new SANS 10083? So I don't know if that is a question. Um, someone's asking, to please explain he noise-induced hearing loss pattern. Um, I, yeah, I think it, it is. I don't think this is the platform for that. Um, yeah, maybe you can ask Sayosh to organize a, a webinar on Good idea. that specifically, and they can get some experts in to um, assist there and provide, because I don't think we would do it justice in this um, webinar here. Yeah, that was not the purpose. Um, um, then someone's asking about financial implications for the employer. So the financial implications only get done, um, they get done with the Department of Plan Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation. That is through the CS process. That's the social e and economic impact of a regulation. So that process gets done um, in the latter stages of the regulations. But once again, if you have any comments about if how much this is gonna cost, for the employer, please again submit it on the prescribed form so the department and the TC can look at it accordingly. But I do have to say that this regulation is not only the wish list of the department, it does go through the advisory council, which is the minister's advisory council for occupational health and safety. And there they are members representing organized business. And yes, they have also given the go ahead for this regulation to go out for public comment. So yeah, if there was some issues they had with regards to the employer, they would have addressed it um, in the ACOS meetings as well. Okay, so yeah, I think Niels, we still have a bit of time, but it has been over three hours. Um, uh, Sorry, one, we, sit, we certainly yeah. have time left on the program. Um, okay, you, so there maybe are, want to take one or two. Yeah, okay. So let me go. Okay, there's one from LJ van Rensburg. Um, this has probably been answered, but please clarify. If there is no autotoxic and vibration exposure, is the action limit of 82 dBA, then the, then the de facto maximum exposure limit? Or is then the still 85 dBA um, with regards in terms of, okay. Uh, is the 82 dBA with no autotoxic and vibration exposure, the requirement to declare noise zone and or would that then be the level at which controls must be implemented uh, to ensure that the exposure limit does not exceed 85? So. It was a bit of a mouthful, um, but yeah, so it's that 
as mentioned by my presentation and Boledwe and Dr. George, is that, yeah, the, the action level comes with that concomitant exposure with both vibration and autotoxic chemicals. And I think it's also mentioned in the noise zoning that it's either to have that concomitant exposure, then it's then the 85 becomes applicable as what is currently required. But if you do have that concomitant exposure, then you need to look at then dropping it down to the action level. Correct. Yeah. And then as is, as you mentioned in your question, then technically 82 becomes the new noise rating limit for that particular workplace. So then you would have to then reduce your exposure to not below 85, but then below the 82 Correct. DBA. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Down to six, I think. Um, okay. There's another one from Esmeralda. Can I ask, is updated SANS 10083 a pre-employment audio to be two tests and then the best values for both tests used to calculate the new pre-employment PLH? I think that's that's basically correct. So if a person is going to be employed for the first time into a noise area, um, then there will be a baseline audio requirement and the audio needs to meet certain reliability and validity criteria, which I've alluded to in the presentation. But the lowest PLH, or some people would say the best PLH, which amounts to the lowest PLH, okay, that would be required, uh, uh, determined as the baseline PLH for that particular employee. Okay, thank you, Dr. George. Okay, then again, there's another question at the bottom from Caroline Dixon. I'm not 100% sure about the audiometric zero. Is the audiometric zero also based on a calculation that must be done? So, yes. Yeah. Okay. So and I think we that's will provide the guideline on how that calculation should be done, Warren. I think that's fair. Yeah. 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 No, that has been noted. Um, okay. There are four more, but other colleagues are answering. Okay. Uh, from Christine, um, in 2016, the SDS baseline started. Are we required to redo SDS baselines to call it an audiometric zero? Warren, I think you're going to take that as 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 the inspectorate. If if so, before you answer that, Warren, let me just say that up until this particular point in time, the requirement to do um, baselines to establish audiometric zeros and then to calculate standard threshold shifts, um, that requirement was in the mining environment. It was not for industry in general. Okay, so we have now introduced this as an industry requirement. So if an employer in industry that's outside of, of, of the mining environment has already implemented um, the establishment of audiometric zero and calculating standard threshold shifts, um, Warren, I, I think as the chief inspector, you may have to answer that question, whether that will be acceptable or not. Dr. George, I'm not the chief inspector, but... Um, oh, excuse me, but yeah. as, as, a, as, a, as a representative yeah. of, of, yeah. of the department, yeah. Yeah. pardon me. So it, it, it comes down to, I think, that um, we have in the code of practice, we have those requirements to say what makes the testing valid and reliable. So... If the employer did it back then and they did it according to those requirements, then there should not be an issue. But if it was done all those years ago, they would need to prove that back then they did that test according to the requirements of the potential new, new yeah. code of practice. So if they can yeah. prove that, then it won't be an issue. If they can't, then unfortunately, they would have to redo it with our requirements that we, that we have in our regulation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, then someone's asked, does, the, does that mean employee who are already working in noise zone with new regulation, they have to do baseline within 24 months? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that comes down to, um, let's, you would only have to comply with the new, this draft regulation once there is a final regulation as well. Correct. So I think that's Correct. what it comes down to. That's it, yeah. 
Um, then Ingrid's asking, have limits for vibration been established? So Ingrid, I don't know if you have registered for Monday's webinar, but there is also a draft physical agents regulations that is also out for public comment. So I suggest that you um, register for Monday's webinar and then there will be more explanation provided then. Okay, then the couple more. Is there a known PLH limit whereby the employee becomes a risk to the workplace and those working around him, specifically in the metal and engineering industry? Dr. George, do you want to give that a go? Good. I think experience has shown that the PLH is not necessarily the best criteria to use to determine people's fitness to either work or not in a noise zone. There are other criteria that can be utilized for that. Um, there are many organizations with the assistance of occupational health experts who have drafted codes of practice containing medical exclusion criteria. They would include criteria for hearing loss. And I think that um, in your particular case, you could either inquire from the OMP who is assisting you or um, you are um, at liberty to reach out to the technical committee, including myself, if that is going to be of any guidance for you. But by and large, my personal opinion is that the PLH is not the best um, criteria to use to determine people's fitness to work in a noise zone or not. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. George. Yeah. So I think also that's why, as the the TC, we didn't put any um any limit in our regulation because there are so many individual factors that play Absolutely. a role. And then again, it will come down to um who's making the diagnosis of the hearing loss and yeah, what they're discussing with the employer in terms of their internal policies which they need to implement. Yeah, so it would be specific to um, each workplace. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just asking one, answering one. Warren, yeah, I see you answering one there. I think that's yeah. the last one now then left, if we can take there that as the last one. A, just one more from Ian Feltman. So it says noise decimeters are calibrated for conformance to IEC specifications and for 85 dBA criteria. Now the calibrations will have to be done for 82 dBA level criteria level, which calibration periodic performance conformance will be calibrated towards which? Okay, so I think Mr. Feltman, please, um, I don't have that answer on me now, but please, submit your comment and a suggestion as how the TC can um, address that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Warren, and the team, and you as well, Dr. George, for um, answering those questions. I think when, I, when it was last open, it was over 153 questions answered. I think that's tremendous uh, that we can have such a, a large gathering and, and, and that type of questions. And uh, Warren, with, uh, as you indicated, if it's, if it's a comment, rather submit the comments in writing. Uh, but the questions were valid that was posed and I, and I thank you all for that. Uh, that brings us to the end of this webinar and I'm gonna call on Elise, if you can please uh, share your screen and your, your uh, uh, mic with us. <laughs> To do the thank you and if you can then maybe just hand up with me for the last part of the closing thank you Good. thank you very much again Niels. So, I'm unmuted. so before i jump into my closing um notes i would just like to remind everybody that this is now the draft regulation so that means that this is not something that is implemented or enforced yet. So this is an opportunity for everybody to, to make comments, to provide corrections, technical corrections, and to provide those in writing to Warren and his team for them to be considered. So there's still quite a, a long road, unfortunately, for Warren and his technical team um, to get this to a regulation that can be promulgated 
So once the comment has been considered uh, by the technical committee, a uh, recommendation will go to the advisory council of the minister. And if they are happy with, with the new draft at that stage, they will then recommend to the minister that these regulations be promulgated. So you can see that there's still a lot of work for, for Warren to, to do in regards to this. But please uh, submit your comments in writing. There were a few comments already in the chat, but they will not be captured here. Please uh, make formal submissions with regards to that. Then I would like to start by thanking all of you for availing yourself this morning and right into the afternoon. I'd like to thank you to Dr. George and Warren for your excellent and detailed presentations. I believe everyone can appreciate the hard work and effort that not only went into the draft regulations, but also in preparing for the presentation and the webinar today. Also in her absence, I would have thank you to Ms. Huna and Mr. Mapa for the support of this work, as, as well as for the draft and, and the webinar. A word of thanks to the technical committee and ACOS members. Some of them were uh, in attendance today. This is some of the fruit of, of your labor. Most importantly, I would like to thank you all, the participants for joining today and for some very lively questions posted online. I would like to remind you of your role in this process is not complete now. In fact, it will only start now. So without your inputs and ideas and discussions on this draft regulations, this sector will not be adequately regulated in South Africa. Thank you to Niels and Gareth from the SIOS team for directing the program and the webinar in your usual very effective way. I'm very happy that during the webinar, we were able to clarify several issues on the draft regulation in the Q&A section. I would like to encourage anyone with more questions to contact us at the department. As a final word, I would like to share with you my personal view on the process of this regulation review. It is indeed a very challenging and sometimes outdrawn process, but during the work of the technical committee and ACOS, the goal remained clear, to safeguard employees against hearing loss due to workplace exposure to noise. This is indeed an achievable goal through the partnership and social dialogue that has been developed and further expanded on today. I would like to again finally invite you to submit your comments and input on the draft in time to the department. In fact, we are quite looking forward to receiving them. Please enjoy your day and thank you for myself and the department side and back over to you, Niels. Thank you, Elise, and also from our side, a huge thank you to the whole team that presented today and fielded the, the, the questions. It's much appreciated. And on behalf of Saj and all his members, uh, we thank the department for, for making themselves available and not just publishing regulations and uh, sitting back and not accepting any comments or sharing the information like you've done. Just a quick reminder then uh, that we will have the Department of Employment's Labor team back here on, on Monday uh, for the physical agent regulations. The Department of Employment and Labor is very kind to industry. They gave us two early uh, Christmas presents this year, the noise-induced hearing loss reg regulations draft for us to comment and do some work and then also the physical agents regulations. And for those who don't know, uh, uh, the, uh, some of those uh, regulations will replace or repeal the uh, regulations that is in the environmental regulations. Again, uh, SARS has also formed the its own technical committee with experts and we're busy reviewing that as well. But let's join us and, uh, and, and see what the Department of Employment has to say. There's quite a lot of new um, items in there. So don't miss that one there. Uh, also, a quick reminder that this um, webinar was uh, CPD verified by SAGE for two points, or SAGE members, as, as per the usual way, you can go onto your profile and claim the two CPD points. And also a reminder that came up lots of times was that there will be a recording available as well as the presentations on the platforms as was indicated into the chat. Uh, SAGE website on the YouTube, uh, SAGE YouTube channel. Uh, on, uh, and also directly send links to our members um, on this on the on the recording and as well as the actual presentations. And a huge thank you once again to the Department of Employment and Labor uh, for partnering with SIOSH when these new regulations come out for hosting these webinars. Thank you to everyone 
Have a safe day, and I'm sure we'll see most of you back on Monday's webinar. Good day.